It is time to go deeper in God's Word. It's time to engage in truth. Here is Dr. Steve Ford and Pastor John Bornsheen. Welcome back to Engage in Truth. I'm Steve Ford, your co-host for today's show. Together with Pastor John Bornsheen, Senior Pastor at Calvary Fellowship Fountain Valley here in Colorado Springs, we are continuing our discussion of the top 10 issues that divide Christians. Of course, the prior episodes in this series and many more can be found on the church's website at calvaryfountain.com. That's calvaryfountain.com. As was the case last episode, today's show is titled Religious Pluralism. Last week, Pastor John provided us with a timely and informative update regarding what has been happening in Israel and how it might tie in with biblical prophecy. We mentioned last week in the introduction that an internet search of the term religious pluralism will yield multiple definitions. They range from embracing the freedom of individuals to worship as they choose to purporting that all religions are equally valid. The emphasis of today's show will be regarding the latter, specifically Do all religions lead to and or result in the same destination? And most especially, does Christianity make exclusive truth claims? And if so, just how important is that? Pastor John? Well, Dr. Ford, thank you again for that introduction. And for last week, you had a wonderful prayer even for the nation of Israel. We really tried to touch on religious pluralism, and we did weave it in a little bit. But given the circumstances that were happening in the world especially there in the land of Israel, that in the whole Middle East, quite frankly, and what we've seen escalate since has now become a global uh, endeavor. I mean, everybody seems to be involved now. I mean, we're hearing opinions from Russia and Turkey and China and the United States, UK. It has become a global endeavor here of how to proceed next. I mean, already we're hearing of aircraft carrier groups moving into that area. Uh, The Gerald R. Ford has now been sent the largest aircraft carrier in the world. And of course, we're pre-recording this program. So we're constantly trying to monitor even over on the the way here. uh, You know, the the news feeds keep going off from around the globe of what's happening. Amir Sarfati, amongst many others, continue to put out videos and, uh, you know, updates of what's happening on the ground. We have a number of churches that we support at Calvary Fellowship that are in the region, in Jerusalem, and two in the West Bank even, Bethlehem and Jericho. So we're getting real-time reports even from those locations from Arab Christians who are grieving this whole situation as well. And I know, Dr. Ford, we spent some time talking about that, how easy it is to be so emotionally charged over this. We can stop seeing the people that need Jesus Christ on all sides of this. And as Christians, we have to step back at times, really in all things, posture ourselves before the Lord in prayer and make sure that we're representing him as ambassadors for Christ at all these things. Lord, help us to see through all the noise. Does justice need to happen? Absolutely. Does evil need to be dealt with? Absolutely. Hamas is an organization, Hezbollah, certainly what Iran is perpetuating and trying to manipulate on all sides of this. Does this, does that need to be dealt with? Absolutely. How do you do it rightly? That's where biblical wisdom comes in. And we got to pray that for all involved, all the leaders, Netanyahu, Biden, everybody. They need the wisdom that only comes through God's holy word, through the Holy Spirit, even to unbelievers. May the Lord press upon them. And we've been studying the book of Daniel at Calvary Fellowship. We just finished Daniel chapter 10. And in that study, you hear and read about how God has even sent angels, one that was contending with the prince of Persia, so that God would have a voice into the lives of three kings in particular to do his bidding in Persia. That means in Iran, the the Lord made sure there was an angel there speaking to and influencing three kings in particular, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, to say and to do the will of God that would benefit Israel. And, and the prince of Persia, the spiritual forces behind the scenes, were in opposition to that. And certainly, if we uh, were to really step back and see the spiritual battle of Ephesians 6 going on all around us, we'd be more mindful of the fact there is a roaring lion who seeks to devour. If given his will, he'd rip every believer limb from limb. He would destroy all of Israel. He would destroy any of the things of God, the places of God, the people of God. He would destroy it. That's, that's his heart. But God is intervening, even in this. And we have to consistently pray for wisdom like that which was given to the sons of Issachar, that they would be able to discern the signs of the times and what needed to be done. 
And we can be so emotionally led that we fail to recognize who we are in Christ Jesus as brothers That's and right. sisters in Christ with a mission for the redemption of souls. That means the redemption of Ishmael, the redemption of Isaac, for Jew and Gentile alike, that the gospel would go forth, that lives be saved, and in the midst of war, peace would come through the biblical lens and God would shine brightly Amen. even through these the, the wickedness of men that he would prevail and they would see him and no man get credit for what God and God alone can do. Yep. Yeah, luckily, the, the lion that you spoke of is no match for the lion of Judah, amen. our Lord and Savior, oh, Jesus amen. Christ. And I think it's important. It will be anathema to some. But our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, died for the Palestinians, too. And he wants to do a work among them, among the, the, the common man, the common woman, the Palestinians, the Arab world, throughout the world. The Lord has a work to do, and we are supposed to be light and salt and to carry that light forward into the world. That's right. And, and I know, Dr. Ford, the hard thing in this is how does Israel respond That's right. to what we talked about before the program was the fact that since 2001, Hamas has manipulated people, stirred them up to wrath to do heinous and evil things, and they've attacked Israel 656 times since 2001. Now, I counted it up on the virtual library to make sure that this wasn't a sensationalized thing, an embellished thing, to make sure I counted it up one by one. And that took a lot of time because I can't find some of these statistics, and I don't want to quote somebody else that I can't verify. And so I counted it up. There were over 31,000 rockets and mortars that were fired into Israel just at random into schools and playgrounds and backyard barbecues for the past 22 years. And so there isn't going to be a proportionate response to this. It is going to be an emotionally charged response and innocent people on both sides are going to get hurt. So as believers, we have to be praying for wisdom and discernment for, dare we say, level heads to prevail for those who are willing to take the high road in a very difficult situation deal with the injustices, but not simultaneously respond as the enemy was behaving, right? That, that's the hard thing, because yeah. we, we have to stand with Israel. We are, we're blessed when we do. Even when it's hard sometimes, we have to, by God's blessing, he has, has a chosen people that he has determined would fill that land. And this has been a battleground since Abraham right. was given that land. And the enemy has been trying to seize it and take it away from him. And so this is a land that's belonged to them, well, for over 4,000 years, or at least right around 4,000 years since it was given to Abram. And he had an encounter with the Lord there on Mount Moriah. And my own personal opinion is I believe that even that region may represent where the Garden of Eden was, not necessarily in Turkey. You know, the rivers changed. We named them the same but post flood, how do you possibly look at the geography and say, well, this because that river's named the same thing? That's where the Garden of Eden was. I don't, I'm not sure that it really was in Turkey or through Iraq, but rather it was possible that the very eastern gate on Mount Moriah was also the eastern gate of the Garden of Eden. And so this is all God's land. We talked about that in the last program that all of this was given to Israel from the Euphrates to the Nile, post flood borders that were given to Israel. And it's going to be always attacked. Israel will constantly be condemned. The United Nations has constantly come out. We're talking about over 100 times condemned Israel, even when they do a preemptive strike to try to mitigate these things or respond in some manner. And here, the motions are now going to get the the best of everybody. There's going to be an all-out assault. Maybe, maybe not. And we got to be praying against these things. So, Dr. Ford, I know that we could spend the entire program on this topic again. What I'd encourage all of our listeners to do is to keep praying. Pray as Daniel prayed in Daniel chapter 9 and Daniel chapter 10. We see a man of God who understands how spiritual warfare is working and how to pray to humble oneself before God, to seek understanding, to seek his will to be done and his kingdom to come. And we've got to pray for that kind of intercession over all who are involved. And and may justice prevail, but may we do it rightly and honorably before God. Amen. Even as Americans, as yep. we're now preparing troops to go over there, how does America respond in this environment as well? And how do we as Christians not get so emotionally charged that we forget our first assignment as Christians, ambassadors for Christ, a royal priesthood? How do we represent Christ well in this? When, boy, I, I can tell you, I'm honest with this. My emotions got the best of me at times, too. I've done a lot of tour groups in Israel know a lot of people there on the ground, even our tour leader, uh, who was just with us in April. 
and and my heart immediately breaks for them. I'm a dad too. I have five children. It's an emotionally sensitive situation. How do you respond in that? How do you enact justice when such atrocities have happened, when such heinous demonstrations of evil have occurred? How do you rightly handle that with the instructions of our Lord, of course? But it's easier said than done. Yeah. And so we've got to pray that the Lord would move mightily in this situation as he's done, and we expect him to do. And we also know that as prophecy unveils in Ezekiel 38, they'll go back to a time of peace. They're not in a state of war that leads to Ezekiel 38. They're in the illusion of peace when they're attacked once again. So what are we seeing? Could it be the building blocks to Psalm 83? Could it be the building blocks of Isaiah 17 of Damascus being wiped out? We keep hearing about arms being moved into Damascus. It's like it's a stage is being set yeah. for that prophecy to unveil real time before us. We don't know yet. We're going to be mindful of that. We're not going to just interject, say this prophecy is fulfilled. That's done. We've got to be very careful in doing that. It's easy to do, uh, especially when we see these things unfolding almost real time before yeah. us. And we go to scripture and go, wow, look at that. That's a building block to this. So we've, got, we've just got to be uh, very mindful of how to read rightly. The scripture before us, go always go to God's word whenever we're anxious, whenever we're angry, go before the Lord in prayer and, and let us be able to handle this rightly and honorably before the Lord. So Dr. Ford will continue to keep our listeners abreast of this as we continue to record these wonderful episodes. I, Of course, I add that in wonderful. I think they're pretty wonderful of engaging truth. Uh, but even throughout the week at calvaryfountain.com, you can go to our website and on Facebook and social media platforms. We try to just post updates of what's happening. I try to address it on Sunday mornings as well. This past Sunday, I addressed it for about 20 minutes before our final uh, guide or going through God's word of Daniel chapter 10. We'll be in Daniel 11 this weekend. So we, we're going to be talking about the rise and fall of the Antichrist at a time when we're seeing some <laughs> building timely. blocks leading to that. I right. don't think that's a coincidence at all. But here we are, Dr. Ford. Let's uh, let's get into this maybe in our few minutes we have. We know this goes by so fast. We've been on the subject now of talking about the 10 issues that divide Christians. And here we're seeing now with the subject of Israel, even how that's created yeah. division amongst believers. And, uh, and dare that not be the case, we know that God has a plan for Israel. And we know that even 1948 and a rebirth of a nation and prophecies being fulfilled and how much there's still left to be done. How many prophecies, over a hundred that I can count, still referencing the land of Israel, the people of Israel, the restoration of the land, the division of the land back to the tribes of Israel. Uh, God has got a lot of things that he is going to see through to completion and so, therefore, we need to be praying for the peace of Jerusalem and the and God to prevail in this as he will. We know victory is assured, Amen. and he will do this, but it will get tougher before it gets better. Zechariah reminds us of that. And even when the Antichrist rises, creates treaty with Israel, breaks that treaty, and then two-thirds of those in Israel are slain, right? And it's, so it's going to be painful before the Messiah comes and, and, and justice prevails in that land. So they're going to go through a lot. So we've got to pray for souls to be saved in the meantime. They need to recognize the Messiah has come and loves them and has given his life for them as he's given to me a Gentile that I can even be grafted into the promises that were given to Abraham and not not grafted into that which was given to Moses, but that which was given to Abraham that I too would have an inheritance in Jesus Christ, my Lord. So we've got a lot of praying to do for souls to be saved in the midst of this and You know, and I probably could go on and on about even some of the Arabs who have become Christians and how passionate they are for Jesus Christ, the few that I know. And I just pray that more like that happen, that that more Arabs come forth and declaring Jesus as their Messiah and and, and more Jews also. And we're hearing the stories of how many Orthodox Jews are now suddenly turning to wanting to hear more about the Messiah. That's the victory in all of this, right? And so as we're talking about religious pluralism, oh, how fitting it is <laughs> that we, we talk about Jesus Christ being the one way, the only way. The, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father apart from him except through Jesus. He is the only way. So, of course, we should be passionate about this subject. I remember, Dr. Ford, uh, back in the day, this has been going on. I mean, people can probably cite a song or two where these the things of life are questioned. I mean, certainly it seemed like there was an era in time when songs had uh, these deeper meanings to them, 
and people would would gravitate to them, especially while the world was in chaos. I mean, certainly during the 60s and 70s, sure. there wasn't just sort of bubblegum pop culture music. There was music where there were people were conveying in ideologies and thoughts and people gravitated. Well, even there was one in 2003 that uh, a lot of young people, I, I remember them just you know, I was younger, obviously, in 2003, <laughs> but I do remember the song was quite popular at the time. There was a, a writer, Douglas Robb, wrote this song for a group called Hoobastank, and even that title, I'm just like, I just shake my head. But anyway, <laughs> here, listen to these lyrics. This is what he wrote, and kids were singing this in the hallways at school. He says, whenever I step outside, somebody claims to see the light. It seems to me that all of us have lost our patience because everyone thinks they're right and nobody thinks that there just might be more than one road to our final destination. So why does there only have to be one correct philosophy? I don't want to go and follow you just to end up like one of them. And why are you always telling me what you want me to believe? I like to think that I can go my own way and meet you in the end. But I'm not ever going to know if I'm right or wrong because we're all going in the same direction. And he set that to a really catchy beat. And all the kids are singing this and not actually thinking about perhaps what they were singing, that basically this is the religious pluralism that is wrought within our culture, that every road leads to the final outcome of all things, that really your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth. It's all moral to, morally relative anyway, and, and you're going to be passionate about your truth but and then try to ridicule mine as though it's lesser of value than yours because yours is the only way, right? I mean, and this is what our, our kids are being inundated with, and Satan is very intentional with that. He, he doesn't care if people worship. He just doesn't want them to worship Jesus. Right, so he's against the one true worship because he knows that God has wired us to be religious people. That's we right. will worship something. And throughout Scripture, you see that even in Romans chapter 1, in talking about how we, we turned our attention to worshiping the created thing rather than the creator, the one who we know him by name, Yah. Yahweh is his name. I find that interesting, too, because Muslims don't know the name of their God. Allah is just God. They don't have a name for him. We know in a personal level the very name of our God and his heart for us. And how often he even speaks of love and teaches us what true love is. It originates at the source of true love, which is in Yah. But we find that this is going all around us. In fact, Hinduism, for instance, falls into this camp of accepting and absorbing all kinds of religious ideas. Even Christ is absorbed into Hinduism. Some people might be surprised to learn that. It views Christ as a way shower, that he's just one of many avatars, incarnations, or supposed guides along the way. And then they use this image. Many religious pluralists will make the point of religious beliefs all basically pointed to the same destination by using the imagery of a blind man and an elephant. It basically proposes this idea that you take a bunch of blind men and you put an elephant in the room, and they're all reaching out and touching something. One grabs hold of the tail, another of the hide, another of the ear, another of the tusk, and they make a description of what they're laying hold of, and, and then they are telling what, they're, what they see in their mind, and that's their truth, that what they're holding on to, the feeling of the tusk, is going to be very different than the feeling of the tail, and they all give very different descriptions, but the reality is it's all just one elephant and they're grabbing onto different parts. So they're basically trying to give this idea that we're all just simply grasping at different pieces. And if we all just get together, we'll realize that we're all going to the same place. And it couldn't be further from the truth. I mean, that would be nice in this sort of utopia of atheistic minds of what they try to perpetuate. Uh, and the reality is even atheism is a uh, is a religion. Right. The agnostics, those are very religious people, sure. <laughs> right? Right. Um, and it takes even more faith in, in those ways of thinking than, than those of Christians. But anyway, this is, so this is what they talk about. And they'll talk about even all paths uh, going up the mountain that, you know, as you think about, okay, there, there's a mountain before us. Is there only one way up the mountain? Or can you go up on different sides of that mountain and all get to the same pinnacle of that mountain? Ironically, in Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 13, the Lord leads his disciples to the top of the mountain where they see his glory unveiled. 
It was the Lord who led them and the Lord who took them to the top. How fitting is that of the image that there is only one path? Christ is the leader to where we're trying to get to. He is the door of which we go through. He is the one, the only one, who can make a way where there is no way. So Christianity gives us the path to the top, but it is only through Jesus Christ. He can't just be a way shower because he says that he is God. Seven times in the Gospel of John, he says that I am. He doesn't even pull any punches. They knew exactly what he was saying. They wanted to stone him when he right, said it right. because they knew what he was referring to, that as the uh, the encounter of Moses at the burning bush Jesus was saying that he also is the I am. He was God amongst us. <laughs> we had a little fun in our discussion talking about Daniel chapter 10, where when you go back to Matthew 24, Jesus is the only one who calls Daniel a prophet. Hmm. Well, none of the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, would consider Daniel to be a prophet because they believe that all prophets, as we see scripturally, had encounters with God. That's what qualified them as their credentials to be a prophet. They see Daniel as a sage because he's uh, moving by way of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to interpret dreams and visions and to receive those even from angelic uh, messengers. But yet, it's the Lord Jesus who says he's a prophet. Why? Well, in Daniel chapter 10, it's clear that he has an encounter with the Lord Jesus. So that means that Jesus is giving credentials to Daniel because he's also telling us that he is God. So that Christophany that happens in Daniel chapter 10 is also affirming that Jesus in Matthew 24 is not just saying that Daniel is a prophet, but he's also saying he had an encounter <laughs> with me right. because I'm God, yeah. right? So awesome. it, da- Jesus can't be just a way. He is the only way because otherwise he's a liar. So he's fully God and he's God with us. He's Emmanuel, God with us. And he is the only way, the truth and life. And that is what he declared so if, if he's just one of many ways, then what he said was wrong, right. and therefore he cannot be a way shower. So th- there's, a, there's a bit of foolishness, as we'd expect from men when, right. when talking about this. <laughs> uh, but Hebrews 9.27 tells us that it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. So no matter what road we've chosen, the only way to, Christ Je- through, to get to God is through Christ Jesus. Right, so there isn't reincarnation. Right. There isn't a second chances. There's not just oneness with sort of a this this uh, you know uh, spiritual force that surrounds the earth and and this utopia that there's presented in that. Um, so Jesus said, I've been alluding to it. John fourteen six. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He also says in Matthew seven thirteen to 14, enter by the narrow gate for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So it's amazing to me, Dr. Ford, just how many Christians even, well, they proclaim to be Christian, only the Lord knows for certain. I mean, certainly we, we see a lot of folks who are emotionally charged, very uh, sensationally motivated when it comes to their worship. And my hope and prayer in that is they are truly, authentically Christ followers. But right. how many start to say things that sound very secular in nature, that there are, that, you know, even when you do some case studies on this, just how many Christians aren't really on board with the idea that Christ is the only way. Yeah. And, and even being sympathizers to others of other religious groups and, and no longer holding a firm foundation in the fact that Jesus Christ is the only way. And I think a lot of that is because we become so supercharged in our entertainment on a Sunday that we become very shallow mm. in the depth of our doctrine, in the right. depth of our understanding of God's holy word. So, you know, we've got a lot of passion leading the way, but no sense to understand truth. And that comes by way of the Holy Spirit. Maybe we just don't even have an appetite for it anymore. Yeah. We're just becoming emotionally led. So we're becoming very pluralistically tolerant. And and that's, there's a political correctness in that. And the cry for broad tolerance of all beliefs has led to this confusion, even in Christian doctrine, where we're seeing churches that are afraid to even speak about hell. And and we have to understand the seriousness of, of this life. It is very short. The brevity of our existence in these bodies yeah. cannot be understated. We have to give that picture. We will be in existence forever in one place or another, either with the Lord or yeah. in this place called hell. 
and the brevity of our time, we're but a vapor, is what Scripture describes us, that we have this one life to live, to, to choose this day, as Joshua declared, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the God of your ancestors or, or and then he declares ultimately, but as for me and my house, we will serve right. the Lord. We also likewise must choose this day whom we will serve. So Dr. Ford, I'm eager to hear your thoughts next week as we really get into religious pluralism. We're probably going to talk about this over the next couple of weeks. I yeah, think. I think it's such so. a, such it's a, a vital topic. subject. Yeah. So I want to thank you all of our listeners for at least um, engaging with us here on Engage in Truth. Thank you for all your comments you send in, your questions, your thoughts. We, we process that, we pray over it, and we're so grateful for your support. To listen to this broadcast and others in this series, go to calvaryfountain.com. Again, this is a ministry of Calvary Fellowship, Fountain Valley Church. Services are 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. on Sundays. We'd love to see you there. God bless you, my friends. Take care.